As brisk as bees, if not altogether as light as fairies, did the four Pickwickians assemble on the morning of the 22nd day of December. Christmas was close at hand, in all his bluff and hearty honesty. It was the season of hospitality, merriment and open-heartedness. The old year was preparing, like an ancient philosopher, to call his friends around him, and amidst the sound of feasting and revelry to pass gently and calmly away. Gay and merry was the time, and right gay and merry were at least four of the numerous hearts that were gladdened by its coming. And numerous indeed are the hearts to which Christmas brings a brief season of happiness and enjoyment. How many families, whose members have been dispersed and scattered far and wide in the restless struggles of life, are then reunited and meet once again in that happy state of companionship and mutual goodwill which is a source of such pure and unalloyed delight. How many old recollections and how many dormant sympathies does Christmas time awaken? We write these words now many miles distant from the spot at which year after year we met on that day, a merry and joyous circle. Many of the hearts that throbbed so gaily then, have ceased to beat. Many of the looks that shone so brightly then have ceased to glow. The hands we grasped have grown cold. The eyes we sought have hid their lustre in the grave. And yet the old house, the room, the merry voices and smiling faces, the jest, the laugh, the most minute and trivial circumstances connected with those happy meetings crowd upon our mind at each recurrence of the season, as if the last assemblage had been but yesterday. Happy, happy Christmas that can win us back to the delusions of our childish days, that can recall to the old man the pleasures of his youth, that can transport to the sailor and the traveller thousands of miles away back to his own fireside and his quiet home. But we are so taken up and occupied with the good qualities of this St Christmas that we are keeping Mr Pickwick and his friends waiting in the cold on the outside of the Muggleton coach, which they have just attained, well wrapped up in great coats, shawls and comforters. Mr. Weller and the guard are endeavouring to insinuate into the foreboot a huge codfish, several sizes too large for it. The interest displayed in Mr. Pickwick's countenance is most intense, as Mr. Weller and the guard try to squeeze the codfish into the boot, first head first, then tail first, then top upward and then sideways, and then long ways, all of which artifices the implacable codfish sturdily resists until the guard accidentally hits him in the very middle of the basket, whereupon he suddenly disappears into the boot, and with him the head and shoulders of the guard himself, who, not calculating upon so sudden a cessation of the passive resistance of the codfish, experiences a very unexpected shock to the unsmotherable delight of all the porters and bystanders. Upon this, Mr. Pickwick smiles with great good humour, and drawing a shilling from his waistcoat pocket, begs the guard, as he picks himself out of the boot, to drink his health in a glass of hot brandy and water. The guard and Mr. Weller disappear for five minutes, most probably to get the hot brandy and water, for they smell very strongly of it when they return. The coachman bounce up to the box, Mr. Weller jumps up behind. The Pickwickians pull their coats around their legs and their shawls over their noses. The helpers pull the horse cloths off. The coachman shouts out a cheery, all right, and away they go. The wheels skim over the hard and frosty ground, and the horses, bursting into a canter at the smart crack of the whip, step along the road as if the load behind them, coach, passengers, codfish, oyster barrels and all, were but a feather at their heels. They have descended a gentle slope and enter upon a level as compact and dry as a solid block of marble two miles along. Another crack of the whip and on they speed at a smart gallop. 
The coachman, holding whip and reins in one hand, takes off his hat with the other, and resting it upon his knees, pulled out his handkerchief and wipes his forehead. Partly because he has a habit of doing it, and partly because it is as well to show the passengers how cool he is. And what an easy thing it is to drive four in hand when you've had as much practice as he has. And on they speed more merrily than before, with the fresh, clear air blowing in their faces and gladdening their very hearts within them. Such was the progress of Mr Pickwick and his friends by the Muggleton Telegraph on their way to Dingley Dell. And at three o'clock that afternoon, they all stood high and dry, safe and sound, hale and hearty, upon the steps of the Blue Lion. Mr Pickwick was busily engaged in counting the barrels of oysters and superintending the disinterment of the codfish when he felt himself gently pulled by the skirts of the coat. Looking round, he discovered that the individual who resorted to this mode of catching his attention was no other than Mr Wardle's favourite page, better known by the distinguished appellation of the fat boy. Aha, said Mr Pickwick. Aha, said the fat boy. As he said it, he glanced from the codfish to the oyster barrels and chuckled joyously. He was fatter than ever. Well, you look rosy enough, my young friend, said Mr Pickwick. I been asleep right in front of the taproom fire, replied the fat boy, who had heated himself to the colour of a new chimney pot in the course of an hour's nap. Master sent me over with the shake cart to carry your luggage up to the house. He'd have sent some saddle horses, but he thought you'd rather walk, being a cold day. Yes, yes, said Mr. Pickwick. We would rather walk. Here, Sam, help Mr. Wardle's servant to put the packages into the cart and then ride on with him. We will walk forward at once. Having given this direction, Mr. Pickwick and his three friends struck into the footpath across the fields, leaving Mr. Weller and the fat boy confronted together for the first time. Well, young twenty stunt, said Sam, you're a nice specimen of a prize boy. You are. Thank you, said the fat boy. You ain't got nothing on your mind as makes you fret yourself, have you, inquired Sam. Not as I knows on, replied the fat boy. I should rather have thought to look at you that you was labouring under an unrequited attachment to some young woman, said Sam. The fat boy shook his head. Well, said Sam, I'm glad to hear it. Do you ever drink anything? I likes eating better, replied the fat boy. Ah, said Sam, I should have supposed that. But what I mean is, should you like a drop of anything as it warm you? But I suppose you never was cold with all them elastic fixtures, was you? Sometimes, replied the boy, and I likes a drop of something when it's good. Oh, you do, do you, said Sam? Come this way, then. Meanwhile, Mr Pickwick and his friends, having walked their blood into active circulation, proceeded cheerfully on. The paths were hard, the grass was crisp and frosty, the air had a fine, dry, bracing coldness, and the rapid approach of the grey twilight, slate-coloured is a better term in frosty weather, made them look forward in pleasant anticipation to the comforts which awaited them at their hospitable entertainers. It was the sort of afternoon that might induce a couple of elderly gentlemen in a lonely field to take off their grit coats and play at leapfrog in pure lightness of heart and gaiety. And we firmly believe that had Mr Tupman at that moment proffered a back, Mr Pickwick would have accepted his offer with the utmost civility. As they turned into a lane they had to cross, the sound of many voices burst upon their ears, and before they had even had time to form a guest to whom they belonged, they walked into the very centre of the party who were expecting their arrival, a fact which was first notified to the Pickwickians by the loud hurrah which burst from old Wardle's lips when they appeared in sight. First there was Wardle himself, looking, if that were possible, more jolly than ever. Then there were Bella and her faithful Trundle, and lastly there were Emily and some eight or ten young ladies who had all come down to the wedding, which was to take place next day, and who were in as happy and important a state as young ladies usually are on such momentous occasions. And they were one and all startling the fields and lanes far and wide with their frolic and laughter. But if they were social and happy outside the house, 
What was the warmth and cordiality of their reception when they reached the farm? The very servants grinned with pleasure at the sight of Mr. Pickwick, and Emma bestowed a half-demure, half-impudent, and all-pretty look of recognition on Mr. Tupman, which was enough to make the statue of Bonaparte in the passage unfold his arms and clasp her within them. The old lady was seated with customary state in the front parlour, but she was rather cross, and by consequence most particularly deaf. She never went out herself, and like a great many other old ladies of the same stamp, she was apt to consider it an act of domestic treason if anybody else took the liberty of doing what she couldn't. So, bless her old soul, she sat as upright as she could in her great chair and looked as fierce as may be, and that was benevolent after all. Never mind, said the old lady with great dignity. Don't trouble Mr. Pickwick about an old creature like me. Nobody cares about me now, and it's very natural they shouldn't. Here the old lady tossed her head and smoothed down her lavender-coloured silk dress with trembling hands. Come, come, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick. I can't let you cut an old friend in this way. I have come down expressly to have a long talk and another rubber with you, and we'll show these boys and girls how to dance a minuet before they are eight and forty hours older. The old lady was rapidly giving way, but she did not like to do it all at once, so she only said, Ah, I can't hear him. A happy party they were that night, sedate and solemn with the score of rubbers which Mr. Pickwick and the old lady played together. Uproarious was the mirth at the round table. Long after the ladies had retired, did the hot elder wine, well qualified with brandy and spice, go round and round and round again. And sound was the sleep, and pleasant were the dreams that followed. Mr. Pickwick was awakened early in the morning by a hum of voices and a pattering of feet sufficient to rouse even the fat boy from his slumbers. He sat up in bed and listened. The female servants and female visitors were running constantly to and fro, and there were such multitudinous demands for hot water, such repeated outcries for needles and thread, and so many half-suppressed entreaties of, Oh, do come and tie me, there's a dear, that Mr. Pickwick, in his innocence, began to imagine that something dreadful must have occurred when he grew more awake and remembered the wedding. A wedding is a licensed subject to joke about, but there is really no great joke in the matter after all. We speak merely of the ceremony and beg it to be distinctly understood that we indulge in no hidden sarcasm upon the married life. Let us briefly say, then, that the ceremony was performed by the old clergyman in the parish church of Dingleydale, and that Mr. Pickwick's name is attached to the register still preserved in the vestry thereof, that it all went off in very admirable style, that the young ladies generally thought it was far less shocking than they had expected, and that although the owner of the black eyes and arched smile informed Mr. Winkle that she was sure she could never submit to anything so dreadful, we have the very best reasons for thinking she was mistaken. To all this we may add that Mr. Pickwick was the first who saluted the bride, and that in so doing he threw over her neck a rich gold watch and chain, which no mortal eyes but the jewellers had ever beheld before. Then the old church bell rang as gaily as it could, and they all returned to breakfast. Where does the mince pies go, young opium eater? said Mr. Weller to the fat boy. The fat boy pointed to the destinations of the pies. Very good, said Sam. Stick a bit of Christmas in them. To the dish opposite. There. Now we look compact and comfortable, as the father said when he cut his little boy's head off to cure him of squinting. As Mr. Weller made the comparison, he fell back a step or two to give full effect to it and surveyed the preparations with the utmost satisfaction. Wardle, said Mr. Pickwick, almost as soon as they were all seated, a glass of wine in honour of this happy occasion. Mr. Wardle proposed Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Pickwick proposed the old lady. Mr. Snodgrass proposed Mr. Wardle. Mr. Wardle proposed Mr. Snodgrass. One of the poor relations proposed Mr. Tupman, and the other poor relation proposed Mr. Winkle. All was happiness and festivity, until the mysterious disappearance of both the poor relations beneath the table warned the party that it was time to adjourn. At dinner they met again, after a five-and-twenty-mile walk undertaken by the males at Wardle's recommendation to get rid of the effects of the wine at breakfast. 
The poor relations had kept in bed all day with a view to attaining the same happy consummation. But as they had been unsuccessful, they stopped there. Mr. Weller kept the domestics in a state of perpetual hilarity, and the fat boy divided his time into small alternate allotments of eating and sleeping. The dinner was as hearty an affair as the breakfast, and quite as noisy. Then came the dessert and some more toasts, then came the tea and coffee, and then the ball. At the upper end of the room, seated in a shady bower of holly and evergreens, were the two best fiddlers and the only harp in all Muggleton. The carpet was up, the candles burnt bright, the fire blazed and crackled on the hearth, and merry voices and light-hearted laughter rang through the room. If any of the old English yeomen had turned into fairies when they died, it was just the place in which they would have held their revels. If anything could have added to the interest of this agreeable scene, it would have been the remarkable fact of Mr. Pickwick's appearing without his gaiters for the first time within the memory of his oldest friends. You mean to dance? Of course I do, replied Mr. Pickwick. Don't you see I am dressed for the purpose? Mr. Pickwick called attention to his speckled silk stockings and smartly tied pumps. You in silk stockings, said Mr. Tubman. And why not, sir? Why not, said Mr. Pickwick. Oh, of course, there's no reason why you shouldn't wear them, responded Mr. Tupman. I imagine not, sir. I imagine not, said Mr. Pickwick. You see nothing extraordinary in the stockings as stockings, I trust, sir. Uh, certainly not. Oh, certainly not, said Mr. Tupman. We are ready, I believe. Then begin at once, said Wardle. Now, up struck the two fiddles and the one harp, and away went Mr. Pickwick. Hands across, down the middle, to the very end of the room and halfway up the chimney, back again to the door, pusset everywhere, loud stamp on the ground, ready for the next couple, off again, all the figure over once more, another stamp to beat out the time, next couple, and the next, and the next again, never was such going. At last, after they had reached the bottom of the dance, and full fourteen couple after the old lady had retired in an exhausted state, and the clergyman's wife had been substituted in her stead, did that gentleman, when there was no demand whatever on his exertions, keep perpetually dancing in his place to keep time to the music, smiling on his partner all the while with a blandness of demeanour which baffles all description. At last they all repaired to the large kitchen, in which the family were by this time assembled, according to annual custom on Christmas Eve, observed by old Wardle's forefathers from time immemorial. From the centre of the ceiling of this kitchen, old Wardle had just suspended with his own hands a huge branch of mistletoe, and this same branch of mistletoe instantaneously gave rise to a scene of general and most delightful struggling and confusion. The younger ladies screamed and struggled and ran into corners and threatened and remonstrated and did everything but leave the room until some of the less adventurous gentlemen were on the point of desisting when they all at once found it useless to resist any longer and submitted to be kissed with a good grace. Mr. Winkle kissed the young lady with the black eyes and Mr. Snodgrass kissed Emily and Mr. Weller, not being particular about the form of being under the mistletoe, kissed Emma and the other female servants just as he caught them. Mr. Pickwick was standing under the mistletoe, looking with a very pleased countenance on all that was passing around him, when the young lady with the black eyes, after a little whispering with the other young ladies, made a sudden dart forward, and before Mr. Pickwick distinctly knew what was the matter, he was surrounded by the whole body, now pulled this way, and then that, and first kissed on the chin, and then on the nose, and then on the spectacles, and to hear the peals of laughter which were raised on every side. But it was a still more pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick, blinded shortly afterwards with a silk handkerchief, falling against the wall and scrambling into corners, and going through all the mysteries of blind man's buff with the utmost relish for the game until at last he caught one of the poor relations and then had to evade the blind man himself, which he did with a nimbleness and agility that elicited the admiration and applause of all beholders. When they all tired of blind man's buff, there was a great game at Snapdragon, 
and when fingers enough were burned at that, and all the raisins were gone, they sat down a huge fire of blazing logs to a mighty bowl of wassail, in which the hot apples were hissing and bubbling with a rich look and a jolly sound that were perfectly irresistible. This, said Mr. Pickwick, looking round him, this is indeed comfort. Up flew the bright sparks in myriads as the logs were stirred. The deep red blaze sent forth a rich glow that penetrated into the farthest corner of the room and cast its cheerful tint on every face. Come, a song, a Christmas song. I'll give you one in default of a better. Bravo, bravo. I care not for spring on his fig. A wing, let the blossoms and buds be born. He woos them amain with this treacherous rain, and he scatters the mare the morn. And in constant elf, he knows not himself, nor his changing mood and hour. And he'll smile in your face, and with wry grimace, he'll wither your youngest flower. But my song I'll troll out for Christmas, out the hearty, the true, and the bold. A bumper I'll drain, and with might and main, give three cheers for this Christmas old. We'll usher him in with a merry din that shall gladden his joyous heart, and we'll keep him up while there's bite or sup, and in fellowship good we'll part. The song was tumultuously applauded, for friends and dependents make a capital audience, and the poor relations especially were in perfect ecstasies of rapture. Again was the fire replenished, and again went the wassail round. How it snows, said one of the men in a low tone. Snows, does it? Rough, cold night, sir, and there's a wind got up, and it drifts across the fields in a thick white cloud. What does Jem say, inquired the old lady? There ain't nothing the matter, is there? No, he says there's a snow drift and a wind that's piercing cold. I should know that by the way it rumbles in the chimney. Ah, said the old lady, there was just such a wind and just such a fall of snow a good many years back, I recollect, just five years before poor father died. It was a Christmas Eve, too, and I remember that on that very night he told us the story about the goblin that carried away old Gabriel Crabb. The story about what, said Mr. Pickwick? Wardle smiled as every head was bent forward to hear, and filling out the wassail with no stint in hand, nodded a health to Mr. Pickwick and began as follows. <laughs> 